visiting artist, Deborah Kr Deborah Kruger, uh, is here this afternoon. Those of you who know me, right, during the workshops, you knew I was going to do that, right? <laughs> um, she's here this afternoon to provide us a keynote address and to give you a uh, a commencement from the big make. Uh, another starting point, where to go. She is an award-winning artist who has exhibited globally, born and educated in the U.S., and currently lives in Chapala, Mexico. Deborah's innovative work aims to wake us up, proving that art, the art of recycling is an art form. It is with the utmost admiration and delightful anticipation to welcome Miss Deborah Kruger to the stage this afternoon. Thank you so much. I want to make sure that I touch on the themes of this important Big Make Day, sustainability, social responsibility, inclusivity, and I thought I would start my talk <clears throat> by sharing a concept from the Jewish culture uh, that's embedded in the word tikkun olam. Has anyone ever heard of that word? Raise your hand. A few people have. Thank you. In Hebrew, tikkun olam literally means repairing the world. And there's, that concept has been a fundamental concept for me since I'm a young girl. And it assumes that our world is not perfect and that it's incumbent on each of us to do something to repair the world. We're here to repair, we've learned through this project, through this day, through these courses, to repair clothing, objects, um, ourselves, and the world. So this concept of repair, along with its sister concepts of upcycling, recycling, and all of that is a really a key concept, not just for this big make, but specifically for me. Um, I have devoted the last number of years to being a full-time artist and being a full-time environmental artist, and I'll tell you more about that, and you'll see examples of my work behind me um, as we go. But my, my focus and my, my um, desire is to shine a light on environmental problems, specifically issues related to extinction, <clears throat> the impact of habitat fragmentation and climate change on species, specifically birds, which are very dear to me, and also endangered indigenous languages, which I'll talk more about. My background, like many of you, was studying textile design at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City when I was a young woman. Um, I, I went to school at a time, and I don't want to date myself too badly here, but there was not a single digital technology or computer to be had. It was way before all that stuff. So I hope you know how incredibly lucky you are to be here. Um, I've just been just completely awe. I'm just awestruck by all the technology you have available to you. And, and as I said in some of the classes, if you attended them, even if it's not your major, try to take some of these classes because the, the, I've never seen so much um, textile-related technology under one roof. It's really kind of mind-blowing for me, uh, who came from a different era altogether. Um, I think I also want to say that I hope you also appreciate this dream team that has made this whole department possible. Um, 
your chair, yeah. Shirley Pearson. Yeah. Your dean, Dean Laurie. Yeah. Your new president, Dr. King. This is truly a company of women and a company of visionary women. You are extremely, extremely fortunate to have their support. So I went to FIT, I studied surface design, and I ended up working in the industry as a wallpaper designer. And the influence of textiles has been throughout my life. I didn't stay in the industry, but textiles stayed in my artwork. And so um, my work is unapologetically decorative. But my work also functions like mating plumage, bird mating plumage, which is designed to attract the opposite sex for you know what. And in my case, I love making beautiful things, beautiful objects, beautiful artwork. In one, in one hand, it, it also is part of the tikkun olam. We live in a world with a lot of problems. And making something that's simply beautiful feels like some step in the right direction. But also, I make um, my work beautiful because I want you to encounter the work. I want to draw you into the work. So like mating plumage, I'm trying to bring you in and if all you do is say, wow, that was really beautiful, that's fine. But you'll have a more profound experience if you really take the time to see what my work is about. And that's been part of my strategy for many years, even before I was doing the work that you're seeing here. When I was a little girl, uh, my mother, who was a twin, her, my aunt, my mother, her daughter, my cousin, and myself spent most weekends working collaboratively in the basement sewing clothing. So whatever weekend we were doing that, we would be like maybe there was a wedding coming and someone needed a nice dress, or maybe school was starting and someone needed a few outfits. So you didn't get something new every time we had our sewing bees. But over the course of months and years, we all had beautiful wardrobes that we collaborated on together. That became a theme for me. And later in my life, um, after I left the industry, um, I was, this is gonna sound a little odd, but I was the CEO for a small medical billing firm. Had nothing to do with art, nothing to do with textiles. And strangely, doing something that was so different than my creative passion actually worked for me. So when I had time to make art, I was fresh and ready to do it. And I didn't feel that way when I was um, a commercial artist. But I think everyone needs to find their way through that. Um, I found myself uh, running a small company at its height, I think there were 11 women working. And when my son was like 10 or 11 years old, he said, Mom, Mom, I'm very upset about something. I think you're a sexist. <laughs> and I was like, me? Like, are you kidding? <laughs> so I said, well, why do you think that about me? And he said, well, you only hire women in your business. Mm -hmm. I said, that's true. So we had one of those big talks that you have with your children if you have them. And I explained to him the difference between white collar jobs, blue collar jobs, and pink collar jobs. And that in the pink collar um, category, there were jobs that were really only inhabited by women and tried to start explaining wh what the cultural reasons for that were. So he, you know, forgave me. <laughs> Although many years later when he was in college, I called him and I said, Jonah, I'm not a sexist anymore. I hired a man. <laughs> 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 he 
Yes, a gay man came and applied to be in our little coven, and it was lovely. Um, now at this stage in my life, um, I've waited a long time for this. I raised a family as a single mom, and I ran the company, and all the while I tried to do art, a little bit here and a little bit there, but in my heart of hearts, even since I'm a little child, I always knew I was an artist. Now I have the great good fortune of working finally full time in my studio. And once again, I am collaborating with a group of mostly women. Um, I have a team of Mexican women who work in the studio with me to produce some of the artwork that you saw in a bit. And this loop will repeat so you'll have a chance to see things again. And one of my visions for my work was that I really wanted to work large. Something about working large just really excited me. Um, so it's just been really fabulous um, to work together to make the large work that I now mostly show in museums around the world. So when you saw some of my work earlier, what did you think it was made out of? Paper, fabric. fabric, all of the work that you saw is made out of recycled plastic bags. Now, I did work and have textiles in my work, in my artwork, for many years. And as I said, I was very influenced by my textile training, and that translated into my artwork. But I had gradually, as I researched uh, endangered birds and why birds were endangered, I realized that I wanted to embed more layers of meaning into my work so that viewers would slowly understand that actually the consumption of many things, but especially plastic things, was contributing to losing birds, to bird extinction. And when I say birds, in a way, it's a stand-in for any species. I just have a soft spot for birds. Um, but it, it's all species are under um, you know, the onslaught of losing their habitat, including humans. So in the course of my research, I became aware that we were also losing indigenous languages all over the world at a very fast clip. So here's a fact that I learned. Currently, we speak 7,000 languages around the world. And by the year 2100, a year in which many of you will still be alive, and certainly your offspring will be alive if you have them, we'll only have 3,000 languages spoken around the world. So we're losing more than half the world languages. And what I realized that in losing the languages, culture is embedded in language. And so losing the languages also means that we're losing the history of the people who spoke that language and their wisdom their, their, in, their information about healing. I mean, we're losing all of it. And if you were to Google last remaining speaker of, you will be horrified by how many articles and videos pop up because that's how fast it's happening. And so back to Tikkun Olam and repairing the world, I've dedicated myself to focusing on the plight of endangered birds and endangered languages, and I have those images are completely embedded in my artwork. I wanted to talk a little bit about art practice. What does that mean? What's an art practice? Anyone want to say? Yes? To me, an art practice is like every other kind of practice, so it's like a spiritual practice, or a religious practice, or a yoga practice, or a meditation practice. And what's the common word? The common word is practice. 
that we become um, good at or become really um, centered in any of those things by practicing them and having them in our lives in a daily or regular basis. And so, for me, having an art practice, there's many levels of art practice, but one of them is showing up, is showing up on a daily basis in my studio, whether I feel like it or not, just like I'm gonna go and practice yoga, whether I feel like it or not, because it's my yoga, it's my practice. So um, I came to the school here, I was invited by um, the chair, Shirley Pearson, to teach many of you new techniques about using recycled materials in making art or objects. Many of you are on a path. I don't know exactly what your path is, but and you may not either, but you're here to learn skills that will prepare you for perhaps bringing products to market or preparing yourself for a job, preparing yourself for being an entrepreneur. And um, I really hope you'll take time to go see the showcase. I stepped in there before this talk and it's completely inspiring to see what you've done with the techniques that I, that I shared. How many people here took a workshop with me this week? So like more than half of you. So what you've done with that is just like, just completely amazing and inspiring. So whether or not um, you were participated in that, I really want to encourage you to stop in later and see the ingenuity that people used in employing these techniques and making objects. It was just really kind of amazing. Um, I thought I would share with you my secrets of success. Some of the things that are really um, have helped me along the way. Um, I have been very blessed with mentors. I, uh, I, I don't know why that is, but the universe has put people in front of me my entire life who thought I was an artist and thought I was a really good artist. So I'm not saying I felt secure about every other part of my life, but because of the mentors, I have always felt really secure as an artist. Like I could wake up any morning and say, I'm an artist and I'm a really good artist. And if you don't have a mentor, well, first of all, if you do, thank your lucky stars and make sure that you tell them how much you appreciate them. And if you don't, having a mentor is really fantastic. And what that relationship looks like will be different for every person. But if there's someone that you admire, it could be a teacher, it could be someone on the faculty, it could be someone who's an artist, it could be someone in industry um, who makes things that you think are really cool. I challenge you with reaching out to that person and asking them if they would be your mentor. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Most people will not turn you down. However, if they do, here's a little secret that will help you for the rest of your life. If anyone ever says no, don't leave the conversation without another name. It like is a really important thing to learn. So if you don't get a job, ask the people, can you think of another place I could apply? Or if you make an important phone call and you get a no, is there somebody else I can call? So if the mentor turns you down because they're too busy, that is no reflection on you, but ask them, can you think of someone else I can call? And I really think that things will shift for you if you have someone in your corner on a regular basis that's rooting for you. Another secret is that I have, especially in the last 10 years, I would say, I have found curators, art curators. These are people who choose artwork for exhibitions at galleries, at museums, and other kinds of um, venues. I have found curators who love my work. And people say, well, how do you get into these museum shows? Like, how did, you, how did that happen? And in all 
almost every case, a curator who loved my work opened a door and invited me through it. So um, I just share that by way of saying that the relationships that you cultivate can really help you move forward in your life. Another secret is the secret of discipline, and that's related to having an art practice or any other kind of a practice. Um, I want to tell you a quick story. Many years ago, I had a very good friend, my good friend Marie. You know, I'm a single mom. I don't make enough money. We don't have enough food. I barely can pay for keeping a roof over our head. But I had an art studio. And Marie was like, are you nuts? Like, get rid of your art studio. You'll be able to feed the kids. <laughs> and I said, I can't do it. Like, even if I have four hours a week, I need my art studio. I need a place, like a placeholder, a promise to myself, a way to say, you are an artist. And even if it's only four hours a week, I'm going to that studio and I'm gonna make art. And she was like, I do not understand you. <laughs> well, 20 years later, I get a call from Marie. And she says, I have an apology. I'm like, for what? She said, well, now that I've retired, the thing I most want to do is write. And I have a little lake house. And on the weekends, I go to my lake house, and I write, and I write, and now I get it. I get why you wanted your studio. Isn't that really beautiful? Mm -hmm. So that's part of the discipline, and it's also part of investing in yourself, which I'll touch on in a moment. I think another secret is health. My, my art practice requires, it's very physical. It's a very muscular practice. I'm not a young person, but I'm on ladders and I'm on my feet and I work now, I work a solid 10 hour day, six days a week when people my age are starting to retire and I'm like finally getting to it. So, to, I, I mean, people say, you want to meet for lunch? And I'm like, I don't do lunch. <laughs> I'm in my studio. I'll meet you for dinner, <laughs> maybe. Um, so I think taking care of yourself in the basic ways you all know, resting enough, eating enough, exercising, moving your body. It doesn't have to be like running two miles, but just doing a little practice somehow to move are ways that matter so that you can be successful in whatever it is that you want to do. Okay, here's two real big ones. One of my secrets is no toxic people allowed. I didn't like, thank you. <laughs> Um, we all have some toxic people in our lives. I think you know what that means. And I am at a stage of my life where I just don't tolerate that at all. If you want to be near me, you need to be not toxic. <laughs> and I just, I don't want to pollute my, you know, my aura with a toxic person. Now I know that's a little challenging if the toxic people are like under your roof but you can maybe spend less time with them. And I am giving you permission today to have less contact with toxic people or break up with a few of them if you are like, oh God, that person is really dragging me down. Um, and sort of a cor corollary to that is no toxic thoughts allowed. Now, some of these things start to work together. So what does that mean? I just do not permit myself to think negative things like, who do you think you are? And what do you think you're doing? Uh, not allowed, not allowed. And that's a muscle that you have to develop, but you develop that muscle by having a mentor or two, by, have, by surrounding yourself with healthy people who are really good mirrors and tell you who you are and you have to believe them because they're not lying to you. And really starting to like see who you are really who you are, not like what people told you you were, most of which is BS, but like who you really are. And then you slowly develop that muscle 
and lo and behold, you don't have toxic thoughts about yourself anymore. It's really, it really works. I had a, oh, here's an example. One of my colleagues wanted to see my new work and she said, can I come up to your studio and see your new work? And I said, of course. So we make an appointment and she comes up and she said, do you want some feedback? And I said, no. <laughs> and she was like, what? I'm like, don't you want to know what I think? And I said, no, I, I really don't. No, I don't want or need to know what you think. I'm on a roll. I'm really like centered. I'm really like grooving on what I'm doing right now. And um, what you think is not like, even if it's good, it's just not useful to me right now. Um, I know that like art critiques, I mean, sometimes they're very useful. Like you have your class, you make your things, your teacher gives you some feedback. But one of the things I've learned is that stay in the driver's seat of any feedback that's coming your way. So like if you want to show someone that's close to you what you've made or what you're doing, tell them what you need. Like, honey, just tell me how great I am. Mm -hmm. Or, honey, just tell me that I'm like brilliant. Like, don't wait for them to say some something that's going to take you off your course. It's like incumbent on you to kind of help people say what you need to hear. So like if you're struggling with something and it's not working, if I have a, like, something's not working, I will bring a friend in, another artist, and say something here is not working. But I'm not, I'm not looking for like anything more than helping me fix this problem. So be very, very, it's, this is a self-care thing. Be very careful about what you let people say to you. Because as you well know, the negative things will resonate and reverberate far longer than anything positive. So you have to engineer those positive feedback loops, okay? I give you permission to do that. Um, I mentioned this earlier, invest in yourself. So like if you really need a good sewing machine, invest in it. Borrow the money, save the money, but spend the money on yourself. It starts this loop of feeling entitled in a good way. Like I am entitled to have good quality materials. Like I will produce better objects, things, clothing, art, if I have better materials. So you are, you deserve that. And that becomes a positive feedback loop. So invest in yourself. I invest in myself once a year, one of my art colleagues and I meet somewhere to see an important art show. So last year we flew in, we met each other in Detroit to see an exhibit at the Cranbrook Art Museum. And it was an exhibit of a Colombian artist that I adore. She works in fiber. Her name is Olga de Amaral from Colombia. I've been following her work forever. And she's now 90. So I don't know how much more, more work she'll produce, but this was like a rare opportunity to see all her work under one roof. And that was important enough to pay for a flight and a hotel and a car to go and really take in that show. And I'm doing it again in March. I'm going to fly with the same friend. I'm going to meet that same friend in New York City. And we're going to see the Nick Cave. You know Nick Cave who does the sound suits? Who, who knows her Nick Cave? Awesome artist. Not Nick Cave, but the, um, there's a singer, not that one. This is Nick Cave, the artist. He's um, an African-American artist from Chicago, I believe. And he's having a retrospective at the Guggenheim. So I'm investing in that too. So just to give you an example, like it may, investment can be very small and it can be very big. But the point is that you start to get in the habit of saying I'm worth it. And the last secret to my success is having the courage 
to dream big. A lot of you are here because you dreamed big. You were like, you know what? I want to work in this industry and I don't have the education. And so I'm going to come here and I'm going to commit to a couple of years to develop who I am so that I can work in clothing and textiles. So you dream that and that's why you're here. And I think getting in the habit of dreaming big is really important. And I'm going to tell you two things I've learned. One, dream as big as you dare. This is something I learned. If you dream like, mm, I think I can maybe achieve 75% of whatever this thing is that you're imagining, the most you'll ever achieve is 75%, probably more like 60, 65. If you dream 100%, you're going to blow way past 75%. So you might not get up to 100, but you're going to get a heck of a lot closer. So, and you know what? I just thought of an example in my own textile life. When I left um, being an employee with an art director and I struck out on my own to be a freelance wallpaper designer, um, one of my mentors from FIT said, you need a rep. You can't just walk in places and show your portfolio, you need a rep. And what I recommend is that you start with the top rep in New York City and work your way down instead of saying, well, I'll start with someone I'm pretty sure will like, like my work and then I'll work my way up. They were like, no, 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 no. Start at the top. So I was like, oh my God, you know, and it wasn't that confident back then. then. <laughs> and they gave me the name of the top, you know, textile rep in New York City and they took me on because I had the nerve to call them and show them my work. So let that be a lesson. The other piece of dreaming big is that a lot of us think, well, I really can't do that because I don't have the money or something like that. Like who's thought that? Come on, you know who you are, right? So when you're dreaming big, just while you're in the dream state, take money out of the equation. Because if you take the money out of the equation, your dream will get a lot bigger. Money, thinking about money stifles things. And I'm not saying money isn't important. Obviously, it's important. But in the dreaming part of the state, take the money out of it. If money wasn't an object or an obstacle, what would I do? And you will not believe how that will free your creative thinking. Then you're going to take your next steps and figure out how to, you know, you know, to accomplish things. And money will creep back in. But I don't want money to be in there when you're when you're dreaming. That's that's not a good idea. You want to really dream free and really, really, really big, 100% all the way up there. I thought I would tell you some of my core beliefs. I believe that art saves lives. I actually believe that. I believe that art is worth making. Who believes art is worth making? Yeah, thank you. Good. I believe that the world needs my art. And I believe that so fiercely that I'm going to ask you to follow me on Instagram, Deborah Kruger Studios with an S. I think it's worth following me. And my Instagram feed is my love letter to all my followers. When, if you want to know what I'm doing, what I'm working on, what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, who I hang out with, follow me on Deborah Kruger Studios with an S on Instagram. I believe because it's happened to me, I believe that art can actually change your mind and it can really inspire you. I think art has great power. Even going up to the showcase is mind bending. Like when you see that, you will be inspired, I promise. I, I mean, I'm inspired, I wanna try half the things I saw up there. I believe 
that the most powerful art, but the reason my art is so successful is because my art is authentic. My art is about me and my life. And I think that you can't really escape who you are. Like, why try? The more you excavate who you are and you do that through your creative process, the more powerful your work will become. And I also believe that my voice matters. So I want you to take a moment, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and I want you to repeat after me. My voice matters. Let's hear it. My voice matters. Once more. My voice matters. It does. It not only matters to you, but it matters to the person next to you. It matters to the people in your life. It matters to your community. And it really helps to repair the world. So don't hold back from making things or remembering how important it is. The last thing that's like a core belief and practice for me is gratitude. I wake up in the morning and my very first thought is, thank God I have another day. I actually think that every morning when I wake up. And then I don't get out of bed right away. I sit there and I think about things that I'm grateful for. And I do that at every meal, whether I'm alone or with other people. So I just think staying humble, staying aware that you're not doing it alone, staying aware that the universe is a good place, even when it's hard, and staying and having a gratitude practice is life-changing. If you haven't had a gratitude journal or gratitude practice, try it. You'll be amazed how powerful that is. So just to sort of bring everything back and around, I wanted to kind of reiterate how things work, at least for me. It's like a big loop, it's a big feedback loop, a positive feedback loop. I make art. I make it out of recycled materials because it's repairing the world. It's very, very layered. I make art with a team. I include other people in my process. I don't work by myself. I don't isolate myself. The women who work with me feel empowered to work with me because they have agency within the studio and they feel great pride in what they do. And I know I couldn't do what I do without them. I have figured out a way for my artwork, even though it's made out of recycled plastic bags, that it retains this sense of textility, of materiality, of texture. That's very, very important to me aesthetically. I'm telling you about the things that, I, that matter to me, about the endangered birds, about the endangered languages, about our fragile planet. And I teach in, in, in venues like this. I teach some techniques. And in so doing, I hope that I open doors for you to make things that are sustainable, to think about sustainability, to know that you, whatever it is that you want to do, whatever it is that you passionately care about, it can be sustainable. It really ought to at this moment in history. I want to encourage you to tell your story. The more authentic you can be about talking about the things that matter to you, whether it's in a product, in a piece of artwork, in a process, the more, the, the richer that product and process and artwork will be. I want to help you launch your careers. Um, 
Some of you will work in industry for other people. Some of you are, are bringing products to market and you're gonna be entrepreneurs and femme entrepreneurs and eco entrepreneurs and fiber entrepreneurs and all of that. Um, not everyone's cut out to work for themselves, but everyone is cut out to find a creative path in their lives. So I think I will end with saying how grateful I am to have had the opportunity to know you, work with you, talk to you. Um, I invite you to talk to me through Instagram and YouTube. And just for a moment, let me say, why is she saying that to us? Deborah Kruger Studios with an S. Why does she keep saying that? Do you know why? Because I think my voice matters. <laughs> That's why. So I hope that you will um, join me now as we end with our new mantra. One, two, three. My, my voice, voice matters. matters. Thank you.